HQ presented by AMC Plus. Let's take a look at Josh Pate's new power ratings from 24-7 Sports and the Late Kick podcast. Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, one, two, three. But then look at four and five and six and seven. That's an interesting order there. Ole Miss at four. Michigan, they've got the huge game with Michigan State this week. Michigan State's all the way down to 16 in Josh's rating. Cincinnati down at six. Oklahoma down at seven. Let's get Pate State in here to discuss this and other things in college football this week. And Josh, let's start at the very top. Georgia number one, taking on Florida, SEC game of the week. Georgia favored by two touchdowns. What are the chances that the Gators in this rivalry game can play spoiler? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Let's forget what I think is going to happen. And let's just try to paint the picture, Chris. So Mm -hmm. let's say our careers depend on a Florida win. Here's the first thing that I would think. I would think to myself, self, where did Florida look the worst last year? And the answer is, of course, against LSU. Then, subsequently, where did they look the best? And the answer is, following that game against Alabama, even in a loss, but a close loss, in the SEC title game. And so uh, half of that history has repeated itself this year. Florida just looked their worst, clearly, against LSU. Maybe, just maybe, it stands to reason that they will then redeem themselves again and look their best against Georgia. Now, even last year, when they looked their best, they lost to Bama. So how do they pull this off against Georgia? Point spread-wise, it suggests it wouldn't be the biggest upset in the world, like we just said, two touchdowns. I think what they have to do is they have to do kind of what they did last year running backs involved in the passing game. It really cut Georgia up in a way that we didn't really expect it to last year. But here's the problem. The problem, as I defeat my own argument, is Georgia also had a guy by the name of Kyle Pitts to worry about last year. They also had Kadarius Toney to worry about. You had a guy at quarterback and Kyle Trask to worry about. And none of those players are on the field this Saturday. So Anthony Richardson, we think, we think, is going to play a whole lot more at quarterback for Florida than he has at any point this year. What we're asking him to do with limited experience is play relatively mistake-free against the best defense he'll probably play at any point in college. That's why it's such a steep task. But if they can grab an early lead, which no one's really done on Georgia, at the very least, it forces Georgia to play catch-up. It forces them into an unfamiliar mode. And at that point, who knows? You just take your shot and hope your team's in Super Bowl mode. 3.30 Eastern time on CBS from Jacksonville, Florida, and Georgia. So we got Georgia 1, Bama at 2, Ohio State at 3. I think those three teams, 1, 2, 3, most would agree, resumes aside, those are probably the three best teams in the nation. But you have Ole Miss at number four. You really think they're the fourth best team in the country right now? From a power rating perspective, yeah. Uh, The model that I used to spit those numbers out would favor them on a neutral tomorrow over anyone behind them. That includes Oklahoma. That includes Michigan. That includes even Cincinnati. Now, it's important to note, Chris, what we're talking about is we're talking about fractions of points. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is a pretty noticeable gap between three and four, between Ohio State and Ole Miss. But, Chris, after we get past those top three, from number four, I think, to like number 15, there's less than a touchdown gap. So it's pretty much rattle the cage and then throw them out there any given week. We could see Auburn up there. We could see Pitt up there. It's really kind of a mess, Uh, although it's a beautiful mess. It's a former hit in the country world by Diamond Rio, seeing as how I'm in Nashville. But it is a mess nonetheless. Uh, But here's the problem. Ole Miss plays Auburn Saturday, right? And I'm picking Auburn to win the game, and I'm picking Auburn to cover. And the problem is scheduling and dynamics. Not only do you have the Auburn home field to worry about, Ole Miss is also coming off consecutively. They played Alabama. They played Tennessee. They played Arkansas. They've they've played a gauntlet of a month. They played LSU last week. Auburn's rested. They're off a bye. And so Ole Miss could very well lose Saturday in my opinion, not really drop of them all that much. And they are slight underdogs in that game. At last check, they were two-and-a-half-point underdogs because they're on the road at Auburn, a team that you have rated in the top ten. Josh, my Twitter replies filled with people arguing about whether the LSU opening is better than the USC opening and vice versa. It's all because I weighed in on one of your posts. So Mm -hmm. tell us, which high-profile job is better? Am I responsible for all the heat in your life? Yes, yes or no? Most of it. Amanda, yes. for, for the rest of it. I mean, I heard the chuckle. I thought this was a two-person segment, and there's just a random chuckle over here. So <laughs> I'll take responsibility. I don't have a problem with that. But here's I was like, I, I'm like leaning up. I was actually trying to fire you up on Twitter about something else entirely. Always. Always. Let's go back to Josh. A, Sorry, Josh. Does she have a take on which job is better, by the way? She, I asked her, and she said she didn't want either one of them. So she's not really much of a help, Josh. Yeah, she's, she's comfortable in that studio, though. This is tough now. Well, like, whichever job you take, it's going to be tough. It's going to be heat-filled. I'm a believer 
partially because of my own opinion and partially because of everybody that I talk to in the coaching industry that LSU's the slam dunk answer here. But yet we get the old familiar refrain, well, don't you want to live on the beach? Like, hmm. yeah, okay, the beach is nice now. I like it just as much as anyone else. We're talking about being a head coach at a major college football program, not a lifeguard job. And so what you have to do is you have to weigh all the critical factors. Ready access to talent. Do I have it in LA? Yeah, but I also have it in Louisiana, the other LA. Uh, but here's what I love. We're showing B-roll right now of just a normal game day at LSU. You don't have to manufacture that, Chris. The passion and that intensity, it's there. It lives there. It's as soon as you walk into the state, you feel it. When you walk into LSU, you don't have to manufacture a lot of the stuff that you have to, at least to start with, manufacture at other places. You're going to get paid more. You're going to have a bigger salary pool for your assistants. They're going to give you a bigger staff. And also, and here's really the kicker for the future, that SEC sticker on your helmet will mean more now and moving forward than it's ever meant before, especially when we're comparing it to one of those Pac-12 stickers that brings with it a lot of volatility and a lot of uncertainty in the future. And I say all that, and people still sometimes come back with, yeah, but why would I want to compete in the SEC West? Why would I want to go up against Nick Saban? Well, you may not, but you're also not the right person for LSU. The right mm -hmm. person for LSU, by default, will be an alpha A-type competitor. They relish that kind of stuff. They're the 0.01% for a reason. So they're not turned off by that. They are, however, very much attracted to the other elements I just talked yeah, about. Yeah, I, I completely agree. LSU would be uh, the job I would rather have as well. It might be easier to put together a championship contender at USC, a team that could run through the Pac-12 year in and year out like Pete Carroll used to do. But look, you're, you're playing at, at Stanford. You're playing at Cal. Not many fans, you know, even show up to those games. And we've seen the sights that we see in the SEC for any game day. All right, you're headed to, to the Big Ten this week. Michigan and Michigan State, biggest matchup of the weekend in college football. What are you going to be watching closest in this matchup of unbeatens? Uh, before the game starts, what I'm watching, there's this period that comes to me every time we get an unexpected, undefeated team this late in the year. There's this period, I call it recalibration of expectation, and it comes around Halloween. It's normally around this time. You're carving your pumpkin, but you're also resetting your expectation. So think about if you and I were talking in August when we were talking about Vegas win totals. Michigan's was, I think, eight. Michigan State was four. Both these teams are already 7-0. and oh. And so by any reasonable metric, they have already vastly exceeded any kind of preseason expectation. But that's not the gauge they will be measured with moving forward. Because right about this time, people look around and they no longer judge you based on preseason. They reset everything. Okay, now you're undefeated. Now I'm going to ask, can you make the Big Ten title game? Could you make the playoff? Will you win the division? Blah, blah, blah. And so the sad reality is there is a chunk of either of these fan bases and the national types that if either one of these teams finish just 9-3, and three, it'll be viewed as a disappointment, which it should never be because your over would have hit in both. But as for the game itself, boy, you've got Michigan walking into a hostile environment still over a field goal favorite, which screams they're about a touchdown favorite on a neutral. And I don't quite know if there's that big a gap between these two teams, and I'll tell you why. I do think Michigan's a little bit better a team. I would slightly lean them to win this game. I have time to change my mind on that. But how many times have we seen this year home field play a disproportionate factor and a role on the outcome of a game? And we were talking before we went on air. This is a really, really hostile place to go into. Sometimes they say that about a place and it's not really true. It's true about Michigan State. Those people pride themselves on making it uncomfortable to go in there. And you could also make the argument this is one of the very biggest games in the history of this rivalry. So those are a bunch of intangibles, but it's kind of an intangible game to me. You've got the bigger playability offensively for Michigan State, the quick strike ability. You've got more a quick sand approach with Michigan. They're happy to play a four quarter game. They're happy to be up 10 at the half, but as long as they choke you away in the fourth quarter, they'll take it. Another drivable trip for you, Josh? You, you, you hopping in the Pate State Mobile, or are you getting on a plane for this one? We are firing up the uh, jet, and by jet, I mean I'll just head over to DNA and take whatever they have available. We got the HQ private jet down here. We'll send it up there to Nashville for you. Josh Pate with us here. Looking forward to your reports this weekend from East Lansing, Michigan and Michigan State. You can hear Josh on the Late Kick podcast, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, 8 p.m. Eastern time. It is streaming live on the 24-7 Sports YouTube page and Facebook page. Amanda, what are you trying to say? I made a decision. What? I would take LSU because of the food. The tailgate food is much better there, and that's my choice. That's some good uh, sausage gumbo. So say you get gumbo. Day. 
jambalaya, whatever you want. Ignore right. the alligator, but that's that's my pick. LSU, so do I. So does Pate State.